Thanks for joining us online. We really are grateful for the opportunity to be able to connect with you. Whether you're a regular here at LBCC, perhaps you're another follower of Jesus and you're just stopping in to see what we're doing, or maybe you're a person who's curious about the teachings of Christianity and the things that Jesus had to say. Our aim is simple as a church. First, we want to connect you, connect you to Jesus, that is, who is the source of all life and goodness. And while we're doing that, we want to connect you to community because community is God's idea and everyone's better off when they're with other people. Secondly, we want to help you grow as a person. People are meant to grow. We're meant to improve and learn and grow and mature as people. When you grow in your relationship with God, it becomes dynamic and changes your life. When you grow in relationships with other people, it helps you have a full life and purpose in life. That brings me to the third aim. Our third aim is to help you invest your life in something bigger than yourself. Everyone knows that, that if we look inward, we often get lost and lose our moorings. But it's the people that take their lives and, and do something with it, invest in something way bigger than themselves, that know that they have purpose and meaning in their life. Of course, the gospel is the greatest thing you can invest your life into. It's a, it's a mission, it's a, a goal that goes well beyond you. But you should also be investing in your family, in your town, in your, any place in your community you can. When you do these three things, connect, grow, and invest, your life is on the kind of track that it should be. Thank you again for joining us online. Here are some of the ways you can connect, grow, and invest at LBCC. We host breakfasts for women and men on the second and fourth Saturday mornings of every month. You can sign up at lbcovenant.org slash welcome slash upcoming dash events. Also, check out our life groups, a great way to meet and get to know us better. Some meet in person, others on Zoom, either weekly or a couple of times a month. Of course, visit our website or call the office at 732-870-2028 to get info or ask for prayer. We'd love to help you in any way we are able. Now here's today's sermon. This morning, um, we're going to have John here next week, so I didn't want to start a new series. And I've had parts of this word in my heart for a, a month or so, and so I spent the time this week working on it and pulling it together. And really what I want to do this morning is encourage you, um, because we all need encouragement, don't we? You got, can I get an amen now? Yeah. The New Testament word, interestingly enough for encourage, is parakaleo, which is the same word or another form of the word parakletos, which Jesus calls the Holy Spirit. In some versions, it says the, the comforter will come, the helper will come, the advocate will come. And the scripture is full of words of encouragement. The scripture understands God, as he inspired those to write the scripture, understood the condition of our lives, understood what life is like, and knew that we needed encouragement. Um, in the Psalm 94, uh, Psalm 94 verse 19 says, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, of course, none of you can relate to that, but I can, you know. So if you don't get this, I'm preaching to me today. It's, it's good. It says, when my anxious thoughts multiply within me, your comfort, your encouragement delights my soul. You know, we all, um, or many of you have probably heard sermons about Nehemiah, who led so well and took these uh, people who had come back to the, the promised land, come back, and they rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem, and they did it against all, all of this uh, distractions and people against them and stuff like that. And one of the things that you know scholars figured out is they did that whole project in 53 days. That's pretty impressive to say, hey, we're going to do this and let's go at it. But do you know, halfway through, they had to stop everything and they needed to encourage them and, give, and remind them what they were doing and why they were doing it. So now if they, they were doing that, and obviously the hand of God was with them because it was actually the, the, the pagan emperor who sent them back to do this, who let them go back to do this. So this morning, my, my title is a, a simple title. It's this, 
in due time. In due time. And I want to read to you this morning a passage from, um, from uh, the book of uh, Galatians. Now let me give you a little background because I'm trying to take a passage out, of, not out of context, but out of a, a, a bigger context. Now Galatians, if you're familiar with the book, it's, it's an epistle that, among other things, clarifies the nature of the gospel. And goes to, Paul goes to great lengths to affirm that salvation is by faith alone, not by works. In fact, a lot of what the epistle is, is he's correcting the Galatian believers who've, who've been fooled into thinking that to, to be fully saved, to really be saved, they've got to go back and keep the things of the law. They've got to get circumcised. They've got to do all of the law of Moses to be able to do that. And there were, these, there were these Jewish Christians who they were called Judaizers, and they came and they, they, they would come to the places where a Gentile church had been birthed, and they said, oh, that's good, but now you need this. And they would throw this on. And Paul, Paul doesn't have a lot of good things to say about them. But what he does in the book is he explains the true nature of our new life in Christ. He declares the incredible freedom offered in Christ, and can, can, can contrast walking in our flesh versus walking in the Holy Spirit. And he reproves them, but still finds ways to encourage them. And that's, that's isn't that God? When, when he tells you you're wrong, somehow it encourages you. So let's look at a passage here, which oftentimes is considered a, a, a passage of re, reproval, but let's find the encouragement in it. So Paul says this beginning in verse 7 of chapter 6. He says this. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from his flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who are of the, of the household of the faith. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that my words this morning will be words of encouragement, Lord. Oftentimes, we have to see the things, Lord, that hold us back, the things that uh, we're thinking wrongly about, uh, and we have to be reminded of timeless truths, Lord, that we already knew, but sometimes lose sight of. And by that, we oftentimes find ourselves weary and sometimes discouraged and having lost heart. Lord, I pray that we can be encouraged this morning. I know I every day need encouragement, and I know most of us do. Lord. So I pray this morning, God, that my words will be words of encouragement to strengthen my brothers' and sisters' hearts and all who would hear what I have to say today. In Jesus' name I pray. So even though Paul spends a good deal of this letter um, saying bad things about people who try to live by works, eschewing works, it, he's, he's pointing in this letter at works that people are doing to earn righteousness. In other words, they think, Oh, I've got to do this and this to really be saved, for God to really love me. And Paul's saying, no, 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 you just have to believe in the work of Jesus. And so while he's <clears throat> saying, you know, you don't need to be circumcised, you don't need to be this and that, it's not like he's saying you shouldn't have works in your life. In fact, he, he is here and in other of his writings, he is constantly calling believers to works, ones that reflect the regenerated and renewed heart of the believer. So we were created for good works, he said in, in Ephesians. So, so his, his focus is on faith, but it's faith that brings a new life and now brings works that come out of that new life, not works that earn that new life. He said it this way in chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes from the law, 
then Christ died needlessly. Now that's, that's his point there. So we, we want to take it from that place and look at our faith and walk like he was encouraging the believers there and the others he wrote to, to walk in a faith as we st- and strive to please him with our efforts and lives. We want our lives to be pleasing to God. But no matter how much we say, okay, I'm saved, God's given me, forgiven my sins, this is great, and we start our journey of faith, at some point, what happens? We lose heart, don't we? We lose heart. And so this is today's memory verse. I'll put it up here a couple of more times as I go through it. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Should I make us all say it to you? No. You know how to do that. So what I want to give you this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, is five truths. Five truths to hold on to, to be reminded of, because they will encourage us as we walk in faith, as we walk out this new life that we've been given. And the first one is this. Faith requires patience. Faith requires patience. Time is always the test, isn't it? Time is always the test. No matter how fired up you are for Jesus, no matter how much you feel your life has changed, time is always the test. We've heard it said many times, it's not the intensity of the trial that we're going through, but the length of the trial. You know? So when things go wrong, you say, okay, Jesus is with me, I'm okay. Six weeks later, you're like, where are you, Jesus? <laughs> I know. <laughs> he says it very plainly, let us not lose heart in doing good. Because if we're not patient, if we can't wait with God, if we can't wait on God, we will lose heart. We lose, our, we lose sight of what's important and we, we lose heart. And we have to remember that in due time, we will reap if we do not grow weary. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I grow weary sometimes. I get tired. I know the things I do and the, the way I try to live my life is what God's called me to, but I don't always see what I want to see out of it. I don't always get what I believe God's supposed to bring forth out of it. And I, I, I oftentimes don't think I'm going to reap and I get weary. You know, the, the writer of the Hebrews said it very similar too. He said it this way. He said, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So when we look back, you know, we've spent weeks now looking at the Old Testament and being reminded that what happened there, when we read what happened in this historical account of God interacting with the, is, uh, the Jewish people, we read this and we say what happened with them is there as an example for us, as lessons for us. And here, the writer of the Hebrews is looking back and saying, look at the ones who inherited the promises. They did it through faith and patience. And we can't forget that. We live in an instant world. We don't want to wait, wait for things. And so we need to be people that through faith and patience inherit the promises. So faith, the first thing is that faith demands, requires patience. The second thing that we can glean out of this passage, these verses, uh, three, four verses in Galatians, is that faith should impact our priorities. You know, it's one thing to say, I have faith. I remember when I was a new Christian, you know, here in Ray at the time was my pastor. Well, he's still my pastor, but my church pastor. And he, he would say, he said, you know, is all of your life saved? You know, is, you're not just Sunday morning, not just when your church meets. Is when you go to work, do you live like you're a saved person? You know, you know the, the way you order your life, is it after God's purposes? Is it what God wants? And... Um, one of the things I've learned is that when I grow weary and lose heart, one of the best questions to ask is, what am I sowing into? 
Because it's so easy to think, oh, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm working at this thing for the Lord. And the next thing you know, all you're focused on is this thing and not the Lord. And sometimes this thing, you know, you got the patience thing. Now you got the priority thing, you know. He said, for one who sows to his own flesh will from flesh, flesh reap corruption. The one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. What, what, do you, what are you sowing into? Sometimes the things we're doing, the earthly things we're doing, trying to follow the Lord, end up becoming the focus. And we can't see God's big picture. It's the old, he can't see the forest because he's focused on the trees. We have to step back. I had to ask myself sometimes, have I made my earthly goals too important? Does God want me to be a good steward of, of my home, of my finances? Of course he does. But if all I do is focus on them, I forget the God part. I forget that it's God's purposes for this, and it all belongs to him anyway. Doesn't mean I should just say, oh, well, whatever. I've done that. That doesn't work out too well. Planning is a good thing. Stewardship is a good thing. But make sure... You've got the big picture there. Your faith should impact your priorities, what you spend time at, what you put first, what you put before other things. You know, my, my new favorite psalm, Psalm 37, says it this way, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, some people interpret that to mean if I point myself toward God, if I say God is my hope, my delight, my joy, then all the things I want, he's going to give to me. But the truth is, is when God is at the center of your heart, when he's your top priority, pleasing the Lord is what you live for, what happens is your heart changes and you start wanting things that you didn't think you'd want. Yeah. He does do that. One of the ways to test your priorities is, is when you go through trouble. When you start getting weary and start losing heart, it's usually because of a trial that's come along, the thing's getting dragged out. I remember years ago, I was a pretty new Christian, and Ray Duckworth was speaking. He was talking about trials, and he says, Tri trials are like hot water, and you're the tea bag. And when you put a tea bag in hot water, what's ever inside of it comes out, right? And, you know, when, when you go through a trial, if what comes out isn't Jesus, let it out then, get it out of you. You know, I lose heart. When I strive in my flesh, I lose heart and grow very, very quickly. So we need to, we need to realize that priorities are an important part of us working out our faith. And a third one is that faith grows in a process. And no one wants to hear that word, process. I, you know, I want to pray and boom, you know. I need $5,000. Lord, you know I need this $5,000. I go home and there's a check in, the, in, the envelope, you know, in an envelope in the thing. Or somehow I got a, a, a refund that I wasn't expecting. You know, that's, that's what I want. But sometimes it's a process of growing in faith. Now, being a good steward. Process means time. You know, Jesus or serving Jesus, we don't like to think of it this way, but serving Jesus, following Jesus, is all about trial and error, isn't it? The Lord says, do this, and you think, okay, and then it doesn't work out. And then you say, why didn't it work out, Lord? And the Lord says, well, change your attitude, or I didn't mean it that way. You know, we, we interpret what God means, and we don't always do it too well. Um, I don't like trial and error. I like to get it right the very first time and get lots of pats on the back. But I learn most from trial and error. Yeah. I met with some leaders a number of years ago that were starting a church. And they wanted, they wanted my advice because I'd been doing this for a while. I started right at the beginning here. And I said, well, one of the things I read is that good leaders learn from their mistakes. I said, but great leaders learn from other people's mistakes. And I'm here to make you great leaders. 
because I, 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 you don't have enough time to hear all of my mistakes. But my mistakes are there. One of my favorite stories, and, and some of you know this story, is that Charles was here, and it was, it was Neil and Tom, and uh, were you guys at that? Were you at that meeting, the, the breakfast meeting? So it's, it's a whole bunch of us having this long breakfast or lunch with Charles when he was here one weekend. And um, Tom and Tony, I think in particular, had these very pointed questions. We're dealing with this. What should we do? And Charles would tell us that he'd listen to our question and he'd tell us this story of this, what happened with him and that sort of thing. And we're like, oh, okay. And he says, so that's how we handled it, but I wouldn't recommend it. Because <laughs> it didn't work out quite the way he thought it. And so then for a while, anytime we talked about something, it would be, this is what we did, but, but I wouldn't recommend it. Trial and error it's part of the process of becoming the person God wants you to be. The Bible calls it that big spiritual word, sanctification. It means that you're going to be changed from who you are more into the image of Christ, more able to do things. Things that you couldn't put aside years gone by, you should be able to put aside now. But those of us who are older know that sometimes that gets harder as you get older, not easier, because you just hang on to things. Think about it. Jesus' disciples did some very dumb things. He didn't dump them. He corrected them and encouraged them to keep on with him. He nurtured their faith through this process where they became these uneducated men and women who changed the world change the, the, the Roman Empire was changed because of that. Paul says it this way in Philippians. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Don't fight God. Let him work in you. Let your faith grow on a process. And you will move forward. You will get there. Perhaps the best example I've ever heard is in Psalm 121. or one. I'm sorry, it's 126. My bad. It says this. Those who sow in tears shall harvest with joyful singing. One who goes here and there weeping, carrying his bag of seed, shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Now the picture there is the farmer who's going, this is what we got left. We could either make some food out of it, or we can sow it for next year, hoping that we'll have a harvest next year. And so he goes sowing in tears. This is the last I got, and I'm putting it in the ground, believing for a harvest. He's fought his way through being weary, fought his way from losing heart and kept sowing, even in tears. And the promise is that he'll come with a joyful, a jo- shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. You know, And that leads us to the fourth truth, which is this. Faith, the kind of faith that Paul's talking about, the kind of faith that we desire to walk in is a faith that holds to God's promises. We have to hold on to his promises. You know, it says it, there's our, let us not, oh, I'm sorry, I went, let me go back there, back. Oh, well, I'll just leave it there. So this is the NLT's version of our memory verse. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. I think that in our instant society where, where you just want everything to work right away, we have to remember that faith requires patience and it requires a learning process. It requires us to grow in a way that God's pri- priorities will work in, uh, in our lives and we're holding on to these promises. This is a promise to us. If we don't let weariness overtake us, if we don't let our hearts sink, 
and we hold on and continue doing what God's called us to do, we will reap a harvest of blessing at just the right time. You know, not my time, not your time, at his time. You know, at his time. If we don't give up. So then finally, faith opens up possibilities. When you're believing God to work through your life, when you're patient in the process of growing, when you work to make sure you're doing the things God calls you to do and not the things just you want to do, it opens up possibilities. The truth is that the life we live is just a series of opportunities. They're all around us all the time. They're right there. Every day, every person you meet, every situation you find yourself in, there are opportunities. There are opportunities if you can see them. But if you're weary and you've lost heart, you just plod right past them. You know how I know that? I didn't read it in a book. I've done it so many times. We'll be sitting talking and talking about something that happened. I'm like, oh my goodness. We, I walked right past a golden opportunity to, to, to encourage a person, to strengthen a person, maybe challenge them in love. But I miss those things. See, the problem with possibilities and opportunities is that they're unpredictable. They're unpredictable. Mac just gave a great testimony. The last guy you'd think that would want to hear the gospel you know, you know, we, this guy in there, they got all the Halloween junk around the store. And they go in there and say, could we pray for you? Okay, so they, they push past that it doesn't look like this is a good place. They say, let's see if it's an opportunity. And they step in there and he says, yes. Opens up his heart to them. Starts talking about personal issues to them. And they minister to him and pray for his mom and for him. It's a wonderful thing. And then they're about to leave. And, and like Max said, he pulls a detective Columbo. One more thing. Turns back to him. And not only did he want to listen to what Max had to say, he was ready to pray with him and receive Jesus. That's an opportunity that a lot of us would miss. I probably would. But those of you among us who are more committed or or more uh, lean toward sharing your faith as a, more naturally than some of us do, you have that ability to see that this could be an opportunity. And you encourage us when you do that. You know? Opportunities, possibilities, um, they seem unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. The guy could have yelled at them and chased them out of the store. and they were, Ooh, That wasn't a great experience. But they wouldn't have found out either way if they hadn't taken a step of faith and seen, well, maybe, maybe this is a possibility. Oftentimes, these things seem inconvenient. I mean, the weather yesterday, hey, let's go out and share the gospel. Yeah. Okay, let's find a place where we can stay dry and do it. Yeah. One of the things that life offers us all the time in these opportunities is the opportunity to respond like Jesus. You know, we need to learn to see with God's eyes when we're living for his purposes. We need to, in everything we find ourselves, we need to say, how am I going to respond rather than how do I react? So you're in the supermarket and somebody, you know, rams you in the back of the leg with, with their cart. And depending on what supermarket you're in, it's more prevalent than others. <laughs> And um, you can either react or you can respond. And that's with every situation we find ourselves in. But life is, opens up possibilities while we have the opportunity. And it really, it really just means time. While in this time, let us do good to all people, all people. That's not, not just the household of faith, especially to the household of faith. That's not. Let's consider a few things Jesus told us. First one was this. Freely you have received, freely give. 
So you have to have your priorities right to follow that one. Because it's not freely you have received, make sure you hoard it up. No, we're, everything God's given us, not, not even material things, but in, in, in spiritual things, in things of life and wisdom, we're supposed to freely share them. And what greater thing has he given us than eternal life? Nothing. And so we have to see these opportunities so we can give that away. That's the attitude we should have. When can I give this away? I have the greatest gift that's ever been given. And if I give it away, it doesn't go away. It multiplies. It's the best thing. And so we have to have that attitude. Yeah. And then it really, the last thing I want to put up here is, is what Jesus said in John chapter 4. He said, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. It really comes back to letting our faith open our eyes to see what God is doing. Yeah. Some of us, um, well, all of us went through the, the Steiger videos in the beginning of the year, and some of us have been at some uh, online seminars with them. I just got a book by one of the folks from Steiger. And, and the, the whole message they have to say is that people that look like they never want the gospel are more open than you can imagine. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was being rejected by so much of his society, but he looked up and said, the fields are white for harvest. And while people don't come to church the way they used to, you know, people used to, like, if their life got a little messed up, I should go to church. Now they go other places. They go online. I don't know where they go. They go all kinds of places. But we can go to them. In fact, Jesus didn't say, build a building and they'll come to you. He said, go and make disciples. So everywhere we go, there's opportunities. There's opportunities for us to do that. So... Let's remember, in due time, let's be encouraged. Maybe the things you're dealing with are tiring, and you think, what's going on, Lord? But in due time, we will see the harvest if we don't grow weary. Amen.